as I'm losing my voice, it's a particularly great pleasure to hand over now to Charles Clark, who you will know for sure was an inspirational and visionary Secretary of State for Education, and somebody who clearly, by their actions, demonstrated their commitment not just to learning, but to the roles, the possible roles that technology could play in that learning. So, Charles, could I hand over to you? Will you organize your own panel? Just grab hold of them and bring them up. Well, what a tremendous afternoon so far. Um, there's a gulf between people like most people in this room who are absolutely committed and passionate and believe that this is uh, something which can transform education experience for millions of people throughout the world, and many people in the educational world who are sceptical about really what can be achieved, are not certain what can be done. And the purpose of this panel session is to try and explore as far as we can what can be done to take this argument forward and to ensure the tremendous research that's been done over these last five years uh, can really make a difference in the way that teaching and learning takes place in a very concrete way. We've decided to take as a subject uh, to what extent, it's written at the bottom, to what extent can the use of digital technology raise educational standards and what should be done to maximise the benefits? That's the question that we're asking of the panel this evening, and then we'll ask of you in the interchange later on. The, the dialogue is intended to illuminate and answer the subject and not to be uh, controversial and oppositionist in nature, but we have got a range of opinions on the panel, which I hope will bring out uh, the wealth of the debate that there is uh, on this matter. I'm going to ask each member of the panel, in the order which I'll introduce them in just a moment, to talk for five to seven minutes giving their answers to these two questions, to what extent can standards be raised and what should be done to maximise the benefits. Uh, and then we're going to go over to, the, uh, to you and have about half an hour of Q&A and discussion around these points. We've got a tremendous panel, and let me just say to the panel, you're welcome either to speak from your chair uh, or to speak from here as you choose. And we're going to go first to Professor Celia Hoyles, uh, who uh, is at the Institute of Education, the London Knowledge Lab, uh, she's an outstanding professor, particularly in the field of maths education, uh, and Celia has been involved for many years now in trying to think these things through in a very substantial way. I have a personal interest in, uh, in uh, Celia, because when I was Secretary of State, I uh, appointed her as what was called appallingly the math Tsar, whose job it was to uh, try and raise standards of mathematics education in this country, where she did an absolutely tremendous job. And Celia, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce you and to hear what you have to say uh, this evening. Well, hello, thank you very much. I think I'll stay here. And I pondered the question, to what extent can the use of education technology raise educational standards? And I decided, Charles, I'm sorry I'm not answering it because I don't think it does. And I think all the evidence from the TELL research says it depends on how it's used and it depends on how it's designed. So I'm not going to answer that and I'm just going to uh, talk uh, about the second part is what could be done to maximise the benefits. And this is where I think the interdisciplinary research community has really made a lot of uh, difference and will continue to make. I will really, this is just a personal take on what has been said before. But I do not think uh, that we should underestimate the importance of tapping into youth culture. I really do believe this. This was a vision of Seymour Papert ages ago. A lot of children, a lot of learners are not engaged in our education. And I think we must find ways that we link them into education. We actually see ways that they can see the knowledge they acquire helps them achieve their goals in the ways that they want to. And I think if we don't do that, we are going to be in a real trouble in our education system. And I think that's something that actually is exacerbated in a world of digital images and easy um, information retrieval. So we need to capitalise on that. So that's the first thing, is I think digital technologies can actually open access to those who might not otherwise be engaged. And we all have uh, seen wonderful experiences of that. The second thing, I think technology can really open windows onto learning, learning trajectories, and where the real obstacles are, because there are different ways of looking at them, whether it's by text or by visual or by graphics. They can all say, well, this is the problem for these children, and indeed maybe help them solve it. 
Then we've heard a lot about how it can, the connectivity uh, can also be motivating to collaborate, to hear other experts in other classrooms, in other countries, who would not be uh, um, motivated by not hearing about, I don't know much about MOOCs, but whatever they are, I'm sure you can actually find out a lot from other people. But I do think it has to be in well-designed tasks and activities. And being from mathematics and a mathematician, the one thing I am really passionate about is I think digital technologies allows you to engage, or learners to engage in the models that underpin so much of their lives. That our research has shown most kids, most people don't even know that they're there. And I do think that's really crucial. And I want you for one second to admire my jewelry. I've got wonderful earrings, I've got a wonderful necklace, but I've got these amazing bracelets that actually were made by a 3D printer. And I, it, I challenge you to look at the design of these because that is in very interesting in terms of what was the program that made these two beautiful necklaces. They are the pride of my wardrobe now. Just of two, three more points. So I think where research has really contributed and the TEL programs have done this, it's serious work to really think about what does the technology offer learning that they really could not do without. And obviously it's dynamic and visual, and maybe using sound, maybe using different sorts of things. And it's not decoration, it really points at what you need to learn. And that is serious work, to say by doing it this way, you will have a different uh, window on your learning. Technology offers feedback in a way that is a way that is so important. And I will talk personally, very briefly, about an experience I had way back, because I'm an old logo person as well, like everybody seems to be around. And I'll never, ever forget the joy of a young child who was working actually in the media lab with Sylvia Weir. She was very disabled, she couldn't really communicate, but she managed to communicate with a turtle and make that turtle do what she wanted it to do. And the sheer joy on her face, because she had thought about what she wanted to do and then she did it and it happened, I will never forget. And we, people have talked a lot about that connectivity and iPads. So I won't mention that again. I'll go to my last point that everybody has mentioned, but I don't think we should neglect it. We have to think about teachers or the trainers or the mentors or the prison wardens. I don't know who they are who do it. They are the crucial people who will mediate this learning. And you really need to be part, and they have been part of all of our, I was a part of one project, they have been part of this project because they're the ones that are going to take it forward. Thank you very much. See, Celia, thank you very much. That was really absolutely excellent and right to the point. Uh, our next contributor is Dr. Vanessa Pittard. She's the Head of Technology Policy at the Department for Education, a very challenging role right at the centre of government, trying to see how these things can take place right across the whole education system, 25,000 schools and so on. It's a massive task. Uh, she was uh, earlier at Bector, the uh, quango which existed beforehand but which uh, was ended uh, after this uh, government was elected, and I met her first in that category so many years ago. But, uh, Vanessa, we're very much looking forward to hear how you think and how you think the government thinks that these two difficult problems can be addressed. Thank you. Well, as, as someone who used to be responsible for evidence and research at Bector, I probably shouldn't pass on the... Um, to what extent can the use of educational technology raise educational standards, because we spent a lot of our time trying to assess that. I think I'll just quickly say um, there was certainly evidence of value, but it wasn't consistent. And uh, what, actually, when you looked into it and asked the question, well, what was it that really made a difference and what should I do in my classroom, for example, it's quite difficult to pin down. So I think that's still ongoing work there in terms of impact. But certainly, statistically, we know that there is a, there is a, that there is a positive impact. It's about how we can um, spread that, how we can maximise that benefit. Um, and that leads me to my second question. I'll make three points, really. I will certainly concur with Richard's point about the pause for thought and the importance of pausing for thought. There have been a huge amount of, of, of developments over the last, well, certainly, certainly 10 years, 20 years, and obviously going back a little way around the use of technology within education and the use of technology to deliver education. So not just, not just having it there in the classroom, but learning through technolo technology. Um, what do we know about it? I think we, we really need to, to look at what, what is surfacing up as the best practice and find ways for that to surface. And that will surface in different ways. 
uh, we're, for example, supporting teaching schools, teaching schools being uh, responsible for taking forward professional development amongst a network of schools, uh, and we have a, a, a network of ICT teaching schools that are increasingly working with each other, and what they'll be doing is, is understanding what's good about technology and the use of technology across the curriculum, and they can start as, as a... a, 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 a a frontline-based networking group to surface the, the practice, the teaching uh, and learning with technology that's making a big difference. Similarly, in terms of evidence, um, more robust evidence, we need, to, um, we need to do more to understand what are the really, really effective um, uses of technology. I'm just really just, just starting to see through, if you like, the kind of mainstream educational evidence, far more technology-enhanced, technology-enabled learning evidence coming through. Now, it's through those kind of mainstream routes that you stand a chance of getting to educational thinkers and to educators. Uh, so there's a little bit of kind of coming out of the ghetto, I guess, in terms of surfacing that really effective, that really effective practice. So pause for thought is, is really important. I think freeing up is important. I think, again, in the, in, in, in the film, we saw the really fantastic examples of what happens when you're allowed to kind of um, shake up the curriculum a bit, free it up a little bit, and certainly in terms of the National Curriculum Review, um, there will be many subject areas across the curriculum that will have, have, a, have a, a, a far more streamlined curriculum than previously. Uh, one of the criticisms of the, the current uh, national curriculum was that um, it didn't free up much time for experimentation um, and certainly in relation to ICT um, it was fairly detailed, fairly prescriptive, uh, at least it was taken that way and it, it, it led to a dull uh, curriculum that, what, that had very little experimentation and it's very very important to allow that innovation to happen so that again um, in you know, two, three, five years hence, we can actually surface some of the really effective practice. So that's my, that's my second point, that freedom to experiment is very important. But we need a reason. And I think uh, what we've missed out in a lot of the work around technology and education and digital technologies across the curriculum is the why are we, why are we using them? What's the problem that we're trying to solve? Um, and look at what seems to be making a big impact, what seems to be benefiting young people, um, students, um, children, and, 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 and why we're actually doing that and what's the problem that we're trying to solve. Because I think it's one thing having very interesting, fun, and effective learning experiences through technology, but actually there are some big challenges and issues, and, and if, we can, if we can look at those in relation to what we're doing with technology, then we stand a better chance of of actually solving the problems uh, and integrating the use of technology far more effectively to achieve better outcomes. Vanessa, thank you uh, very much indeed, in particular for uh, confirming that the department is keen to try and make progress in whatever way it can to try on the issues which have concerned people at this conference. And thank you very much for setting that out. Our third speaker is uh, Professor Alison Wolfe from King's College London. Uh, Alison is a very leading uh, practitioner and commentator on education. She was recently asked by the government to produce a very uh, influential report on uh, post-16 further education. But she's commented and written on a much wider range of issues, uh, not just in the educational field, but also much more widely about public policy. So, Alison, we're very interested to hear how, how you see this difficult area. Well, I, I think I'm here as the sort of sceptic-in-chief, um, <laughs> which I sort of have a habit of being on technology panels, uh, including at one stage uh, on, on the, the, the Bechter board. Um, and I am going to say a couple of things about how we should be cautious and also understand why many people particularly many teachers, resist the idea that technology is, is the answer. But I'd like to contextualize my own remarks first in terms of, if you like, personal experience. And first of all, I should say that I, like I guess everybody else in this room, rely on 
technology and educational technology in, in everything I do. I mean, it's not just smartphones, ordinary email, and all the rest of it, but I do a great deal of data analysis, and I therefore use statistical packages. I use the processing power of, of modern machinery, and I'm also incredibly grateful for the capacity we now have to display results visually, imaginatively, in a way which enables people to understand things far more clearly than, than used to be the case. So that's the first thing I'd like to log, because I think that's, that's very important. And, and the other thing I'd like to do is, is, is also be a little bit nostalgic, because um, when I saw those pictures of Celia and Seymour Puffett, um, my children had fantastic experiences with Celia and with Richard um, in Saturday workshops that came out <laughs> of some of your research projects, which were, in terms of education, just, just amazing. They were, they were so lucky. And they worked with Logo and they worked with Cabri, and one of them in particular became a fairly decent programmer and wrote a game which he sold on the sold and, and actually made some money out of. Um, and I think that was educationally fantastic. But it also brings home to me the fact that for much of my adult life, I've sort of been waiting for this revolution to happen. And it sort of hasn't, and, and that makes one wonder why. And I think some of the reason why is what I want to go into now, which is the, 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 the cloud inside the silver lining, the, the cautionary tales. And I want to give you three in particular. One is a true story about a student who came to see a colleague of mine at a statistical help session for, for um, people writing dissertations. Unfortunately, well into their design, had got their statistical design done, and it was not very good, and it wasn't right, and it was clear that this student didn't really understand what was going on. And they were using what remains the most common package for, for master's students in this country, which is um, statistical package for the social sciences. It's been renamed. But, um, and this student said to my friend, um, this and this, this, and I don't really understand it. And um, Tony said, um, you don't understand it? And the student said, no, I don't understand it at all, but it doesn't matter. SPSS understands it. <laughs> now, that is a true story. Second true story is something that I observed just the other day in a newly opened school, um, which was self-consciously, very much at the forefront of all sorts of things, would have been horrified at the idea that they should even allow anything approaching old style pedagogy through the door and everything you know everything was was very 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 highly um, tech based but it was also something in which young people were encouraged to go and explore and do their own work and not sit in classrooms and be given projects and as I was going round, I wandered over to a couple of girls in the corner who hastily turned off what they were doing um, and I said to what are you working on and they said oh nothing because we can't get anything the internet's down well the internet wasn't down and I wasn't trying to catch them out I had actually been quite interested in what they were doing but basically it brought home again the fact that yes you can use the computer in a very directed and effective way you can also waste an enormous amount of time on it and again for a large part of my adult life people have been telling me about the glories of student-centered learning and leaving people to go out and explore and do whatever they want and this is an age-old tension mm -hmm. in in education I mean really age-old and I don't think the computer has solved it I think the computer has made it even more acute um, and the third quick cautionary tale is one you would hear from anybody who, like me, deals with first-year undergraduates who don't understand that cutting and pasting is not what you mean when you ask for an essay or a term paper. So those are my cautionary tales. And the reason I bring them up here is, is not just in order to be my, my usual negative self, though it's that too, um, but because I also think it, it underlines two facts. First of all, it underlines what both Celia and Vanessa have said, which is that essentially... Technology is wonderful when it is used wonderfully by teachers. And when it isn't used wonderfully by teachers, it isn't wonderful. And I also think it's why you get this polarization partly out, out in the field, because many teachers are very aware of the downsides as well as the upsides, and they react very much to being told that they are 
out of date, that they're using old style pedagogies that they really wouldn't if they had understood that it was now the 21st century. And so a reaction sets in and they become very negative. And you, you do still get this polarization between those people who are sort of 100% for it and those people who are, for that reason, 100% against it. And I think there are now fewer people in those extreme camps, and I, and I guess that's progress. I do think that, that more and more people now use technology intelligently and partially, and partly because it's just much more reliable and it's easier to use. But I do think that we still suffer from that problem, and, and I'm not sure whether it'll ever go away. Um, and, and I also think that's one reason why, again, as, as Vanessa has noted, when you, when you sort of run regressions and you put computer use in, it never turns up as showing anything. And, and that is because, essentially, it depends how you use it. Yes. <laughs> it depends. It depends. But I want to finish with a, a sort of a, a, a question and a mystery, which does relate to, to Charles's question, really. For most of the technologies that we've been talking about and that we've seen being used out in the, in the exhibition where there was indeed some, some wonderful stuff, this is stuff that in a sense, nobody needed to go and sell to the public. Nobody needed to convince us all about the virtues of, of email. Nobody had to convince us about the virtues of, of memory sticks. I mean, they sort of sold themselves. Smartphones sold themselves. As soon as they were sort of out there commercially, easily available, people bought them, and they didn't need government programs to persuade them. And the thing which sort of puzzles me deeply about educational software is why it has never really taken off easily in this way because it can't do everything but there are things which it can do there are particular tools for particular things which are clearly to me um, really wonderful they make it more productive more effective they're, they're clearly solving a concrete problem so so why is this such a hothouse plant why does it keep needing government help why does it keep needing <laughs> to be the subject of special programs to get anywhere and I don't know the answer, though I do wonder if part of it is simply the speed of innovation of the sector as a whole, that you are constantly running to keep up with the progress in the hardware and the commercial software. But if I'm right, then it's probably the case that the thing we should hope for, curiously enough, is a slowdown in innovation, because then one would actually have a market in which this, these often quite niche products could actually develop and be stable and, and, and make their way. Because I think until that happens, until it stops being the case that people only really get access to it if they're part of some innovative program or part of some special study or they're getting extra funds, until that happens, education technology is not going to fulfill its potential. And we are going to be having the same conversation, though hopefully not with me as the resident skeptic in another 10 years' time. So that's where I'd like to leave it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alison. I don't think you were very sceptical. I thought you were uh, uh -huh. judged well, in, a, in a judged <laughs> way. Our final panellist is uh, Richard Brooks, who's the Director of Strategy for Ofsted. And we're very grateful that Richard's been ready to come today. Ofsted obviously plays an absolutely central role. I mentioned earlier there are 25,000 schools in England and Wales, and Ofsted looks at the practice uh, throughout those schools over a period of time and uh, makes judgments uh, on the basis of raising educational standards right across the range. And so, Richard, we're delighted you've come today and looking forward to hearing uh, what your assessment of these questions is. Thanks very much. I I'm delighted to be here as well, not least because... I'm very often speaking to audiences of, uh, of head teachers and teachers, which means that I'm staring out on a massed rank of people with their arms folded and their eyes narrowed, <laughs> hoping that I'm going to um, you know, choke on my words. Um, so delighted to be here. Um, I I'm really going to focus on the second part of the question, uh, because I don't know the answer to the first part. Uh, to what extent can educational technology raise educational standards? I mean, my... My, my, my hunch, actually, is quite a lot, but not quite yet. You know, it, it doesn't feel to me like it's quite a mature, a mature system. And I think Alison's question is really great. You know, why is it, if there's such great potential in what's here at the moment, is it such a hothouse flower? I think that's a really, really great question. So I'm going to focus on uh, what should be done to maximise the benefits. And in a nutshell, my answer is we should improve the quality of school leadership. And if we do that, then I think a lot of the other things will follow, and I'll, I'll just unpack that a bit. Um, 
I, I thought it'd be worth saying a little about how Ofsted inspects schools and how Ofsted therefore inspects the use of educational technology. Um, in, our, in our inspections, we only make four graded judgments. So we look at a range of data uh, relating to the school. Um, we spend a couple of days on site in the school and look at all aspects of the school's work. And, but we make four graded judgments. We grade the achievement of the pupils. We grade the quality of the teaching. We grade the behavior and safety of the pupils. And we grade the, uh, the leadership and management of the school. So just four graded judgments. We don't specifically judge the quality of the use of technology. Uh, and we have no view on what the right kinds of educational technology are for schools to use. So, and this is really important if you're trying to convince people to do things, to try things, to, to use the sorts of products that some of the people in this room are developing. If you want schools to use those products and you think that Ofsted is an important lever to get them to do that, then you have to make an argument that the technology affects one of those key processes or outcomes which are what we're focusing on. Our focus is on the core processes and the outcomes in the school. And so the impact of technology is felt through those things, teaching, out, teaching achievement, leadership and management is part of it, behaviour and safety probably less so. Um, we, we also survey, occasionally we look specifically at a, a group of schools, about 150, so it's not a huge sample. Um, we survey schools looking at their teaching of information communication technology uh, and also their use of, uh, of ICT. Uh, we do this on a, a three-yearly cycle, and the last of these reports came out at the end of last year. There's some quite interesting things in it. I, I just, uh, just mentioned a few of them. Um, one is that we found primary schools to be doing better than secondary schools, making better use of technology uh, than secondary schools. And that was a bit of a puzzle. Um, it's not just because the technology is somehow simpler because smaller children are using it. Um, one of the things that we, we think it might be linked to is that actually the way that primary schools audit their staff development needs and link their staff development needs to their development of information communication technology appears to be stronger than in secondary schools uh, and in many cases more cohesive. So the school takes a school approach to it, whereas in secondary schools it's a more sort of patchwork uh, affair across the schools in some cases. Um, we identified some of the concerns that uh, I know Alison shares. We saw uh, quite a lot of low quality vocational study. Um, still, I'm afraid, you know, lots of people learning how to use, uh, uh, to use office uh, and lots of people studying for qualifications that don't give them really anything of great value in the labour market. Um, we saw weaker topics, particularly around the sort of the harder and more technical end uh, of, these, of the subject area, data handling, control, computer science. On the good side, we saw lots of investment and enthusiasm, but we saw less evaluation. So quite rarely did we see schools which were really effectively evaluating what they'd done, how they could make it better, what the next things they should do were as a result. Uh, one area that I thought was, was particularly encouraging was um, some particularly good examples of practice in relation to children with special educational needs and disabilities. It's clear that technology can, can open the door for them to aspects of learning that were previously much harder to access. So in all of these issues, I think it's the head teacher and the leadership of the school that is most important. You know, they have to see technology as the engine for innovation and raising standards in the school, if it's really going to catch fire. And, and like all sort of teaching, uh, teaching approaches, using technology, I think, has to be done with focus and with fidelity. And that really has to be, has to be driven from the top. It requires effective leadership. I think at the moment, the technology probably outstrips the capacity of most schools, the great majority of schools, to make use of it. So if you were going to invest in any one sort of part of the system to get more value out of technology, it would actually be in in the school's use of the technology rather than in the technology itself. And, and I think the people developing the technology can do some of that investing in the schools as they develop their clients and help them to understand how to make, how to make good use of it. And I'll just close by, uh, by sort of saying that I think what good leadership means in this case is the same as what good leadership means 
in terms of, say, the core processes of pedagogy, of a standard classroom teaching. It means prioritising the right things, involving the whole school. It means being evaluative, evaluating what works well and what works not so well, and then being developmental on the basis of your, of your evaluation. I think I'll just, I just want to read a, a quote that I thought sums up my, my view of this really well. It's from the, uh, uh, from the Andrew Adonis book, Education, 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 because uh, he, uh, he writes better than I speak. Um, he, he says, he's talking about all the various different things that he might recommend, all the other things that he might be interested in, all the other policies that people come and talk to him about. And he says, it's not from top-down prescription, let alone tips from politicians like me, that the best innovation the best technology, the best teaching and learning and the best national and international practice will sweep through our schools. The wind of change takes the form of outstanding teachers and school leaders dedicated to doing the best professional job within their power. And I think that's the key to making this technology really work for kids. Well, Richard, thank you very much indeed. Very clear and to the point. I remember a study, was it a million hours, uh, some 20 or 30 years ago, that uh, said that the key thing, uh, absolutely key thing in school transformation was the quality of the head. It didn't really matter what their ideology was or how they approached it, but as long as they were clear, it took you a very long way. Now, we've got about 30 minutes, as I said, perhaps a bit less. Um, I'm very struck by the answers we've had from the panel, actually, on our core points. On question number one, to what extent can the use of digital technology raise educational standards? A couple of the panel ducked the question, and the best that can be said about the others was patchy and inconsistent uh, is the answer. Um, I think actually there's, a, there's a, a group, there are groups of students, particularly those with special needs, people have mentioned um, particularly those with some, some educational disadvantage, uh, prisoners have been mentioned, where I think it's uh, slightly more accepted that uh, technology really can uh, raise educational standards. But I think a core problem for this world, if we believe that uh, technology can improve things, a core issue is if we're not getting a clear answer to that question, then we're going to find it pretty difficult to persuade whoever, whether it's head teachers or government or individual teachers or whatever, to make it go. So I want to just spend the first 10 minutes in questions to you. How do you answer in the floor this question, to what extent can the use of te educational technology raise educational standards? Does anybody here have more of a clarion call than any of the panel were able to offer saying, actually, yes, of course it does, you're a fool, don't you understand, if you only look at this, and so on? Actually, I didn't say that, Charles. And no, I, have to, I do actually think there have been some studies where this has been done, hmm. uh, and particularly in the United States, where they invest much more in uh, research. And it always is a sort of regression to the mean, because if you, some will use the technology well, and some will not. And so what will happen is that you get some very marginal effect. Recently, however, there has been one study, a very big study, a very well-funded study, and maybe that's something that the government would like to do, where they did find that there were some advantages of technology in terms of higher order thinking skills, okay. not very specific. So I think it can be done, but I think you need huge uh, numbers to try and get rid of this uh, regression to the mean. Just Sorry. Think. No, no, it's fine. Uh, I'm, I'm take comments on this first of all. Firstly, Lady there, please. And can you possibly just identify yourself as you speak? Oh, have we got mics going um, Yes, you I'm Margaret it. Cox from King's College. Um, and oh. I wanted to just comment and mainly on Alison's comments, but also I'm not surprised you can't answer the question because I don't know what it means, educational standards. Um, because the whole point about technology is that it is innovating the way students think and learn. So therefore, we should have a standard performance or expectation, because that's not what these technologies are all about. The second point is that there's no such thing as one digital technology. It's like saying, to what extent can books raise standards? It's a range of things that, which affect the way people think and learn. So to give you an example, and Alison, going back to your point, I think you drew on mainly looking at the conventional way of teaching and learning and then how can different technologies enhance that. The point is that people aren't learning conventionally anymore. The way knowledge is presented to them, and the example given by the young lady earlier is a very good example with um, <laughs> programming, and as Celia knows and Tim O'Shea knows, if children learn programming, then they learn metacognition 
and to analyze the things that are, they're being taught in a different way to the way we expect them to learn. So one of the mistakes we made very early on in the 70s, and Diana's here as well, because Diana and I shared an office, was we started to try and measure the impact on simulations on students' learning by using the traditional problem-based tasks at the end of the activity. And of course, they weren't learning that. They were learning how to hypothesize relationships using graphical representations. And so it's very difficult to say digital technology raised. So that question should say, to what extent can the use of a variety of different technological devices improve the expertise and knowledge and understanding and ability to learn of children? Not, not what you've got there. So, it, I'm, <laughs> so, so I'm not surprised you couldn't answer the first part, which then has a knock-on effect on the second part. Because what does it mean, maximize the benefits? What benefits? That they're going to become lifelong learners and be able to adjust to new kinds of employment when they leave. Or benefits that they're going to adjust and pass, get better GCSE levels. So, you know, I think you ought to scrap that question <laughs> and start with a new yeah. one. Okay. <laughs> other, other comments from the body of the hall, please? Yes, lady over there. Thank you. Uh, Diana Lorillard, Institute of Education. So I'm now going to continue with the habit of a lifetime and argue with Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> because I think Charles's question is perfectly reasonable. He's put that useful word can in. To what extent can the use of digital technology raise educational standards? We know what he means by that. Margaret, it's not, don't worry about what education, can it improve education? Can it help people learn more and faster and better and achieve more than they could without the use of digital technology? And the simple answer is yes, of course it can. But as Celia and Alison and Vanessa and Richard all said, it depends, it depends, it depends. Just as anything else, as, as, just as anything else does. But what we know about digital technologies, is that they can do things like personalization. They can respond to what the learner is trying to do. They can do all of the things which Richard was describing and which were in, in that film. So, of course, we have to figure out ways in which we can maximize what they can do. It's no good as saying, oh, well, we shouldn't ask the question that way. We know that's what ministers and investors and teachers and everybody else is going to ask. Can they actually raise? Yes, that's why we're all here. So the answer is a very simple yes, all the way, as far as we can possibly take it, if we're prepared to invest the time and energy and inventiveness and imagination in doing it. Thank you, Diana. Gentleman towards the front here. Gentleman towards the front here. And then somebody right at the back after that. Yep. Mike Sharples, The Open University. So I'm going to carry on that theme, which is that technology can improve educational quality. Why isn't it? Well, one of the answers is very simple, because it's banned, because it's not allowed into the classroom. There are learners who are coming in with very powerful devices, not just the technology, but also very powerful environments. Environments for collaborative learning, for researching online, um, for communicating with other people, and they are banned in schools. And we have got to get over that, because what we're doing is we're substituting um, technology that is old-fashioned and that is based on an old-fashioned pedagogy. Um, three years ago, we did a study for Bechter, and we interviewed uh, or surveyed around 2,500 children. And one of the questions we asked them was, do you use your mobile phone for learning in class? And over a quarter of the children said yes even though they were banned in all the schools that we asked. <laughs> so children are already using their personal devices for learning underneath the desk. We've got to change that. Thank you. There was somebody right at the back there. Yeah, the gentleman just there with his hand up right at the back. And after that, I'm going to ask the panel just to respond to these questions. This is one right there. Thank you very much. And there's also somebody... Uh, just behind him after that. And after um, those two, I'll just come to the panel for a quick so, response. So um, I'm Alistair Clark, and I work in adult education. Um, I just to stick with this uh, first part of the question, um, I would contend that used badly, digital technology can seriously reduce 
educational standards. And the trick is in the, um, I think as, uh, as Alison said, uh, it, when it's used wonderfully, it has wonderful results. And the trick is actually to ensure that the <coughs> teachers and the learners, and I'm more concerned with adult learners, but, but whoever they should be, are fluent in the use of technology for learning and th are, are able to choose the right tool for the right job and to be able to think through what that will do for them, both as teachers and as learners. So I think the investing in our teachers is important and trusting in our learners also to be able to make sensible judgments about technology is key. Thank you. And the gentleman just behind you. Is somebody right there? He's not, no longer hand going up? OK. Uh, Celia, what's your response to yeah. this, uh, this set of comments? Yeah, I really agree with that last point. But I want to come back to Alison's story about SPSS. I mean, we've all <laughs> suffered this, uh, where, and this is happens in schools, where you suddenly get a project with lots of beautiful graphs. You just press the button and you get a pie chart, you get a bar chart, or you get an SPSS with P less than what's it, and they haven't got a clue. I think that was your story. Now, clearly, that is very, very undesirable, but that's not technology's fault. This is what I was trying to say. We can outsource to the technology stuff. And one of the things we can outsource to this technology, Alison, is doing the statistical test that we... I don't know whether you used to do it with, you know, like log tables. I mean, it's complete... But what you've got to do is you, we have to develop an attitude where you don't just let the technology do it. Okay. You actually have, amongst an educated person, wherever they're in a vocational setting or in a, a university or in a school, where they say, where did that number come from? And why are they? Why have we got that? And this is exactly what we try and do always in try and open it up a little bit. How did SPSS work that out? Or how did that thing, that... Um, um, that video game, how was it programmed? That's exactly what we have to do. And it's that attitude of saying we're just being done to that we have to get away from. Alison? Yes, I also agree very strongly with the last comment. And I think I agree with everything that you said too, oh, Celia, no. actually. Oh, no. um, because I, I think in a way, it, it is a, it's, it's the same point about how do you use technology. But I do want to disagree with Margaret. I, it's not in the least clear to me that young people learn differently. They're genetically exactly the same as all our ancestors were. I haven't seen anything that suggests from the psychology literature that human beings have changed dramatically. We have different tools, we have different contexts, we have different content. But we learn by being challenged, we learn by having feedback, we learn by having it explained to us why something is wrong, we learn by having clear goals that we actually try to reach where the gap between what we do and what we want to achieve is, is comprehensible to us. Um, and we learn by concentrating and putting a good deal of effort in. And if simply being parked in front of you know, digital technologies was such a great thing, we would by now have got rid of the yawning gap between five and six-year-olds and achievement that happens when they come into school. Because if you look at preschool exposure to digital technologies, there isn't very much of an income or class gap. But there certainly is a huge gap already by age five or six in what young people can do. So in a sense, I'm just making the same point, that, that the danger is that actually digital technologies can make it very easy to teach badly. And they can make it very easy to create an environment in which, to put it bluntly, kids are spending a lot of time on Facebook and not learning very much. Thank you. Uh, Vanessa. I mean, I certainly agree with many of the cautionary tales, and I think anyone who's ever taught in a classroom will have seen some of those. And I think it's, it is quite right where technologies are disruptive and they are influencing the behaviour in the classroom that they are controlled. That's, that's absolutely right. But where they are constructive and productive, they are used. Um, of course, what we're faced with is consumerisation of technology, and those two technologies are coming closer and closer together, which is a challenge. And I think we certainly need to... Um, understand where schools have overcome that challenge, how they've done that, and share that share that understanding. I think that's very important. Actually, I think there's... I've, I've said this for quite a while. There are technological solutions to some of those challenges. Um, uh, you know, I, I've heard people talk of, why, why can't we have school mode app on, uh, on, on a mobile phone so that it can be used productively? I'm not pr presenting that as a government solution, by the way, and that's not a government position. Uh, but... but um, some of those challenges can be overcome, and we do need to look at, 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 at ways of at ways of doing that. So I, I will I will kind of 
you know, say cautionary tales, we do need to avoid them. Um, but I, but, uh, but there are some very productive ways that technology can um, enhance learning, help help scaffold learning, help teachers to manage learning. And I think the, the role of the teacher is absolutely key in, 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 in all of this. The idea of a kind of a, well, I've done it, you've, I'm sure a lot of, of us have done it, the bland e-learning at work. Um, you know, let's get this certificate to say you've done your fire safety training or whatever it happens to be. And there is nothing more not mind-numbing, and that's a really bad example. And that's totally tutor teacher free, totally, totally kind of um, antisocial, you know, totally unguided but apart from pages on a screen. And we want to avoid that as well. And there are some very rich ways that technology can be used to enhance the teacher's management of the classroom, the teacher's teaching, and also scaffold um, the learning in ways that are meaningful so that exactly the kind of, um, you know, the, the, the ways that learning happen can, can be helped. And we've got to, to bring that out um, in everything that we do. Thank you. Richard. Um, there's danger, isn't there, of the panel just sort of violently agreeing with each other. <laughs> um, so I wonder if I could... I wonder if I could slightly cheekily actually ask a question um, which is you know, is it right that actually the same things drive the quality of the use of technology as drive the other key quality variables in education the quality of teaching the quality of staff development or is there something else you know my, my sort of hypothesis is actually that you know Leadership teams are really good, heads who are really good at focusing on the progress of every child and do everything they need to do to make sure that each child achieves you know, the best that they possibly can. We'll just use technology in a way that is sensible. But maybe that's not right. I'd be interested to hear if people have a different, <coughs> different view. I have a uh, sort of hypothesis um, that uh, I really do think that everybody also ought to engage with the technology. Just have a go because it's very, very easy to go in and judge. But I think you've got to have a go uh, yourself to actually experience what differences that people are trying to make. So I think it does make a difference. I think you just have a little bit of experience yourself. OK, uh, I'm going to ask for more contributions, including responding to that question. On the second part of the question, just to summarise what I heard said earlier on, um, firstly, the quality... If you're going to change the culture in which technology is used and can produce benefits in the way that's been talked about... The role of the school leader, the teacher, in fact, the leadership team, is it's been suggested is extremely important. Obviously, the role of individual teachers, and there's been massive programmes on this, which have, some have not worked, some have worked. Uh, the question of Ofsted is interesting. Uh, what Richard was saying in his first answer uh, was that uh, it's necessary to focus on some of the goals of Ofsted and understand what technology can offer to answer some of those points if one's going to see moving forward, because Ofsted is a major... Uh, lever for change. Di um, uh, Celia made the point at the beginning about the importance of engaging young people directly by using this technology, which I think is also a very important point. Uh, and there were general issues about, about connect connectivity. One of the contradictory points that Alison said I thought was an interesting point about slowdown and innovation. My working assumption, actually, is innovation is going to accelerate and keep accelerating, and anybody who tries to say stop the world uh, will just stop here as it moves on will find it difficult to do that because innovation will keep moving forward. So there's a set of questions on this, the second question, what should be done to maximise the benefits, that were said by the panel and by one or two in the, uh, in the hall. Other comments on those points? Lady at the front, first of all. Gen uh, lady just here, please. Okay, I've seen a couple of others. Um, can you just identify Thank yourself, please? Thank you. I'm not in academia, but I'm speaking as someone who has... It's allowed, by the way. Sorry? It's allowed not to be in academia. <laughs> oh, yes, but <laughs> just to make, come from a different perspective. I've worked with teachers in different schools, right from age three to sixth form, for about eight years. And I see fantastic teaching, but I see teachers who have got interactive whiteboards that they use as blackboards because they've never been shown. Yeah. So it, the technology's there and the teachers desperately want to do it. And I've seen English departments turned around just for being shown. So I think the whole thing about um, you know, technology with, can help with teaching, but the teachers have to be helped first. And, and that's just so important. And with the pace of change, teachers 
are frightened. I've had teachers being given iPads and put them in a drawer for two months because they just didn't know what to do with them. And just So we, I think that's something that so needs tackling. And on your primary secondary point, um, I think, um, um, by the way, that teacher later became a complete champion. So it is possible to take the, I'm not the weakest notes, one. And I don't know what school you mean. No, 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 I know you don't. I'm purposely not mentioning any names. But primary and secondary ICT take up. I think because primary teachers are, look at that whole, I'm, I'm, this could be controversial, but they look at the whole child a lot more and they see that te how technology reaches out to all aspects. Secondary teachers I've worked with are much more subject focused and they want to know what can it do with this just specifically for my subject. They open and they change their minds once they've start, once they have that support. Okay. And it's great. Thank you very much. The gentleman in the red jumper was indicating back there. He's got his hand up now. Yeah, uh, in, in this context of maximising benefits... Sorry, would, you, would you mind... Could you just identify yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Richard Millwood at the University of Bolton. Um, and in fact, the Institute for Educational Cybernetics, which is why my question is like this. Um, clearly, to me, there's a system of education. There's, there, are, there, are, there are flows of information. There are effects on people. People are influenced. One of the big, big influences is, is assessment. It's, it's, it's the examinations that are going to come up. Nobody's mentioned this so far. And when Alison was so um, concerned about why didn't schools adopt this, why aren't schools, you know, why isn't it happening? Surely we should be asking the question, um, in what way can technology help a child pass an exam? I was going to mention, was, it was very interesting, I was going to mention that nobody had mentioned assessment so far, it's a key point. There was somebody in the middle back there, the, that's right, the pinkish shirt. Asher ross uh, Brighton Business School. Um, in thinking about technology and its impact on standards, I think it's quite important to distinguish between the range of technologies, uh, apps and hardware uh, being innovated at an increase in pace and may or may not be successful in being taken up by people. But access to the internet undoubtedly is being taken up by everybody. And to some extent, I'm only following on from the comment made by a colleague from the Open University earlier about mobile phones in schools, that whether we as educators want to try out new software programs or new pieces of hardware may or may not be relevant, they may or may, or may not appeal. But undoubtedly, learners have access to enormous amounts of information and views and the opportunities to collaborate through the internet and that fighting against that or arguing about whether or not that can or can't be adopted seems to almost pass the point. It has happened. We are all connected. They are all on, they, we, are all on Facebook, or many of us are. Finding the most beneficial ways to use that to maximise the benefits rather than trying to fund additional projects or fighting against the fact that our pupils have connectivity all the time. Thanks very much. Take a couple more before we end. There's a gentleman there with his hand up, glasses. Um, not currently wearing my glasses, but oh, I can borrow Richard's. Hello. I beg your pardon. Hi. Oh, I, sorry. I need no more worries. glasses, or in fact, I don't uh, need these glasses. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a, a question about leadership that uh, Richard's alluded to. I think it is a vital um, strand in uh, improvement and raising standards and so forth. So could you but just identify yourself, please? John Potter Institute of Education. But it is extremely difficult to innovate in a system which is so performative and which places such huge uh, punitive measures upon um, teachers who, who do innovate uh, and who don't feel that they have the space in which to do that. So I'd like to just stand up a little bit for teachers who perhaps did tuck the iPads away in the drawers or whatever because perhaps they just had no room or felt they had no room in which to innovate. Um, and I'd like a, some response on that, I think. But I do think the leadership's important too, obviously. Thank, Thank you. you. There was somebody right at the back in the corner there. Uh, I won't say whether you were wearing glasses or not, but... Uh... <laughs> uh, I'm Mark McCourt. I'm the chairman of the Teacher Development Trust, but I will skip the obvious thing of saying professional development um, is the key here. I just want to come back to something that Celia said at the very start about it's not the technology it's what you do with it and the design and this thing of maximizing the benefits well this word benefits actually if you look at the vast majority of technology that's out there and is badged education it's really not very good 
In fact, it's garbage, the vast majority of it. Um, and the vast majority of technology being used by teachers is being is stuff that's come from business, so you know your Microsofts of the world, and being shoehorned into learning. But very, very few things are being developed ground up, values based, evidence based, focused on learning and what's what we know is effective in terms of teaching and learning. There are lots of apps and programs and things out there that are commercially successful. The amount of times I go and inspect classrooms and see things like my maths being used to pacify 30 children, uh, see them doped and sat there in front of a, a screen. Um, but for a company to take a values-driven and evidence-based approach to designing education technology, like Logo was, I was a great fan of Logo as well, it needs to be commercially viable, and there needs to be some sort of incentivization for companies to do that. And I find it interesting, Richard, that you talk about Ofsted not having a view on what effective technologies in the classroom are. Well, you should have, because you can be that incentivization. You can say that, um, actually, the type of technology you're using, the design of it, it shouldn't be a passive thing. It should be a resource that a teacher is critically assessing and using, and you can be one of the drivers there. Um, I think that would be a very helpful thing to do. The word maximize, there are lots of projects that go on, like outside in the exhibition, very effective products, very exciting things, but they're not reaching a large audience. And unless we reach the 25,000 schools in England, then the impact will be... Uh, well, minimal. So being able to maximize that as well is going to require not just um, academic projects, but commercially viable projects so that companies can put out educational products. Thank you. Now, I'm going, unfortunately, to stop it there because we're getting right close to the end. I'm going to ask the panel now, in reverse order to what we've just been doing, to respond to the discussion, uh, and then I'll wind up and then pass over to Richard to introduce the final session. Uh, Richard. Well, I suppose I should just respond really to, to that last point. Um, I think it's really important that Ofsted does not directly judge the technology for two reasons. I mean, one, we're bound to get it wrong. You know, inspectors just won't know what's good and what's bad. Uh, and secondly, it's very hard for them, it would be very hard for them to disentangle whether the technology itself is good or whether the use to which it was put was appropriate. So I just I think we should really focus on on the impact of the technology through the outcomes for the pupils and the core processes of the school. And actually if we get that right, then we create a very strong incentive mechanism for schools to adopt things that work. Thank you. Uh, Vanessa. I would I would definitely reiterate the, the the point about outcomes. I think outcomes have to be the starting point really. Um, I Mark, I take your point entirely that actually to deliver improved outcomes, you do need an evidence-based approach to design. And there are many, many poorly designed educational apps out there and, and all sorts of different software. And there are some very well designed. And more often than not, that's on the basis of evidence. Um, and uh, I would certainly encourage that. I was also encouraged to hear um, from the Secretary of State for Higher Education and Science, um, David Woolitz, that, that uh, education has been identified as one of the sectors for the Technology Strategy Board, and we do know that educational technology um, is one aspect, is, is an important aspect of that. So that may well be the route uh, by which there could be some opportunities for that more commercial approach and de developing very good products that will have much more commercial potential. So we'll, we'll see how that develops. I think that's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, Alison? I'd like to pick up on the point about, you know, surely it'll sell if it helps kids to pass the tests. Um, and in a sense, that really sort of redoubles the puzzle, doesn't it? Because you would think that by now there would be lots of information going up and down the, the, the country and along the grapevine about where there are things that help people to pass the tests. I know that this will horrify Margaret that one should even think about this, but the reality in a, sc in a school is one does. And, and, and I suppose that to me just, just again, you know, what is the gap? Is it an, why doesn't the information go round? I mean, there, there, there is good so software. Why doesn't it spread educationally in the way that it does, for example, in management information systems? I, I don't know. 
you. Thank you. And Celia. I think it's a really good question. I want to go back to evidence-based design. All these projects in this TEL programme, we all did very careful theoretical and empirical and thinking before we designed our product. And then it, the design is iterative. It's hugely labor intensive. It's the only way that we can design. And we did three years of very, very uh, serious work. And I think the point about where do we go now is another point in a way it's beyond my capability as a researcher. But I do think uh, the problem is this country is littered with really good stuff. But how we can take it further in the way that Mark said at the back I don't know. I mean, Tim O'Shea made a wonderful point to the minister, said, well, maybe we could have another phase or whatever. But I do think there is good stuff around, much better than the stuff that's often used. Actually, talking to my Ofsted panellists, a lot of stuff is not used well and it's not good. And I think we've got a better um, array of stuff. And I just don't know how we take it to the next step to publishers and uh, get it more commercially viable. I think this has been a very interesting conversation. I'd just like to make a couple of wind-up remarks myself. I suppose I found it a rather depressing exchange in the sense that I think the challenge for those who believe that technology can help improve education uh, is the, the difficulty of making that case has been illustrated by the discussion we've been having. What seems to me to be the core points are, firstly, it is necessary, I'm afraid, uh, to, broadly speaking, accept the system as is, i.e., millions, and I do mean millions, of parents, families, children, <coughs> teachers are driven by a set of educational standards uh, aspirations, which many people don't like, uh, the assessment systems or whatever. But any effort to bypass those things and say we can do something in a completely different way, I predict we'll find it very difficult to succeed. Uh, because uh, the fact is people are driven in a whole variety of ways to uh, make education achievement core to what they do, and they measure education achievement in ways which are very conventional and, uh, and not necessarily the ones that may even be the most rational. Secondly, it's obviously critically important to change the culture. I agree very much with the comments about head teachers and about teachers in general, though I would say that the efforts that have been made to develop continuous professional development for teachers in these areas have been very, very patchy in what has actually happened and how it's actually moved forward. There have been some big expenditures of government money which haven't succeeded in the ways that were, was hoped at the time. And I think thinking what's the mechanism for achieving that is very important. It should be obvious that the teachers of this country are the potentially essential force for transforming everything in this area. And the fact is we have to think harder about how to make that uh, a goer. I think the third thing I would say is that there are other levers. Ofsted's been mentioned. I think it's a very important uh, lever. But there are other uh, levers, including funding streams and other issues, which need to be very seriously considered and thought about in this area. But finally, the core point is unless these various stakeholders are convinced that the use of technology, however you define the word, can actually improve the quality of education, however you define that word, uh, in schools throughout the country, actually, they won't do it. And that's why Alison's question is relevant. Why hasn't it happened anyway is a very, very good question. Everybody's got Maywell phones today. Uh, they, that wasn't a result of some government program or whatever. They have found it to have utility for them in a variety of different ways. And I think, Richard, in uh, thanking the panel and handing over to you, I think the work that you've done in this research program has been absolutely outstanding and positive, but now needs to be taken forward into trying to answer the kind of questions that the panel, the panel have been trying to discuss to see how we can do it. So can I, on behalf of all of you, thank our panel very much for coming today and for contributing to what I think has been the most interesting discussion. <laughs>